everyone. Welcome to Ask Me Anything. My name is Frances Hume and I work at a charity called Interfaith Scotland. Now, over the last few weeks, we have been asking pupils from primary and secondary schools to send in questions to our young people of different faiths. And today I'm delighted to have two young people here with me. I have Kieran Deep Core from the Sikh faith and Sydney Switzer from the Jewish faith. Now Kieran Deep lives in Edinburgh and she's a trainee solicitor. And Sydney lives in Glasgow and she's the youth coordinator of the Scottish Jewish community. Now before we get to the questions from all our different school pupils from around the country, I'd like to ask Kieran Deep and Sydney a little bit about their faith. So I'm going to start with Kieran Deep. Can you tell me a little bit about the Sikh faith, please? Yeah, sure. So the Sikh faith, or Sikhi, was founded in the 15th century. So it's one of the most recent religions in the world. The founder of the Sikh religion was Guru Nanak, who was born in 1469. He preached a message of love and understanding and that it was better to be a kind person than follow ritual practices that didn't mean anything. Guru Nanak passed on his enlightened leadership of this new religion to nine successive gurus. The final living guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, died in 1708. Now Sikhi is based on equality, justice and selfless service. Equality means that all men and women should be equal. Justice is that we should make sure that people aren't treated badly and selfless service, which means that we should always help the poor where we can. There's three main principles in Sikhi. The first one is called Nam Japo, which is about remembering God. So this is done through focusing the mind on God's name and his blessings. The second principle is called Kirit Kuru, which is about honest work. Here, Sikhs should work hard using their talents and should do work that makes their communities a better place. They should be positive um, and keep going forward even when life is difficult. The third principle is called Vand Shuko, which is sharing with others. And this is about sharing your wealth with other people in the community, giving to charity, and also um, distributing in the lunker or free kitchen. In the Sikh religion, a Sikh is expected to contribute at least 10% of what they earn to help other poor people in the world. There's also the concept of seva which seva just means selfless service or helping others for no reward in return. Great, thanks Karen Deep, that's really interesting. So I'll move on now to Sydney, if you could tell me a little bit about the Jewish faith please. Yeah, so Judaism is a very old religion in contrast, um, perhaps it's the oldest of the three Abrahamic faiths, which are Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Um, and we go back a long, long time ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jews follow the Torah, or in English we say the Old Testament, which is also read by Christians. And in the Torah, there are 613 commandments, or mitzvot, which are principles and laws and different things that we follow. Uh, there's a lot of different things, <laughs> a lot of different commentary, a lot of different ideas that we will get to later as we go through. But there's a really interesting story from the Talmud, which is another book that we read. We have the Torah, which is sort of the main book, and then we have the Talmud, which is the commentary. And in the Talmud, it says, one of the rabbis was speaking to a student and the student said, can you teach me the whole Torah while standing on one leg? Judaism has lots of fun analogies like that. <laughs> and the rabbi said, sure. And he stood on one leg and he said, love your neighbor as yourself. The rest is commentary. So basically we have a lot, a lot of different things going on, lots of festivals, lots of rituals, lots of beautiful texts, lots of beautiful prayers, um, so many beautiful things. And the core of it is loving your neighbor as yourself. And with that, loving yourself, loving God, loving all of these things. Super. I like that story. That's good. That's really nice. Um, 
So I'm going to go and start with some of these questions that have been sent in. And the first one is, did you choose your own religion or did you follow your family's religion? So I'll start with you again, Karen D. Um, well, I follow my family's religion. My um, mum and dad are both Sikh as well. Um, however, as I've gotten a bit older, I think I've learned to respect it a bit more and then also understand it a lot more than, than I did when I, was, um, when I was younger. Okay, thank you. And uh, Sydney? Yeah, I think I agree with that as well. I mean, my parents are Jewish and I was raised in a Jewish household, but I think that as I've gotten older, I've explored it in a really different way. Um, there's lots of different sects of Judaism, right? So there's um, people who take it more literally, people who take it more metaphorically. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've come to do a lot of things that maybe my parents don't do, but that I find meaning in, which um, has been exciting. And now I'm working uh, in the Jewish community, helping other people explore that for themselves. So that's also it's been very meaningful for me. Thank you, Sydney. I might ask you the next question then, because that's coming on from that, is what things do you like about your religion? Gosh, I like a lot of things about my religion. <laughs> What's the one thing that I really like about my religion? Um, I think I think the community of it is really important. And that's also during lockdown, something that's been really difficult. So I'm from Canada, as you might tell by my accent. Um, so I was raised in Canada. And then after high school, I moved to Israel. And then I moved back to Canada. And then I actually spent two years in India, where I had all sorts of amazing experiences with all sorts of religions, including Sikhism. Uh, and in all of these places. And then I moved to Glasgow and in all of these places, um, I had such a beautiful, me meaningful Jewish community and it really made me feel at home. And that's something in lockdown, especially that having this place, the synagogue, the Jewish community, the people, the holidays, right? And we celebrate the same holidays, whether you're in Canada or Israel or Mumbai or Glasgow. And that's been really, really special. And I'm glad that I have my Judaism to hold me to that. Lovely, thank you. And how about you, Karen D? Um, a bit like Sydney, I think the um, sense of community is quite big within um, within the Sikh religion. A lot of it is based on helping um, helping those as a community. Um, but I think the one that kind of that I like the most, if you could pick one about Sikhi, um, is the whole concept or the whole idea of um, of justice. So fighting for something um, that others might not be able to do so themselves, um, and that's really 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 touched me whenever I do anything um, is, is this idea of making the place a better and fairer world um, for other people. Okay, thank you. So now an interesting question about your day-to-day -day life. Um, we've been asked, how do you pray? And why do you pray? And actually, what is it like to pray? So Sydney. Yeah, so prayer is an interesting thing. With Jews, there's some Jews who are quite um, observant on a daily basis and who follow the, the rules in the Torah quite literally. There's, I think there's a film of this guy who tried to live a year biblically and there were all sorts of funny, um, you know, all sorts of things that come up that you don't think about in terms of daily living. And there are people today who take those things really literally and who follow those things. Um, and there are Jews also who don't pray at all. There are Jews who don't believe in God. There are Jews who, who identify as spiritual Jews, as secular Jews. Um, so many different types of, of Jews identifying as different things. So growing up, we prayed. We would go to synagogue on Friday nights, usually. Um, we had a prayer book. We did stuff, you know, like it was, it was pretty casual. But then as I got older, when I moved to Israel, um, there's prayer services three times a day. So you have your morning prayer, your afternoon prayer, and your evening prayer. And you also have prayers when you eat food, and you have prayers after you go to the bathroom, and you have prayers before you go to sleep, and you have prayers the second you wake up. Um, and I think that learning about those things, I never knew about that as a child. So learning about all of those things, I think really brought a lot of meaning to me. Um, it's pretty cool the second that you wake up to sort of open your eyes and like immediately go into thinking about, wow, the prayer we say is thank you God for returning my soul to me for giving me another day and that's that's really special and so now I really enjoy having these, this sort of toolbox of of the prayer book to sort of guide you through guide me through the, through the day through the week through the year and to have all these different prayers that come up at different times is really special 
That's lovely. Thank you. And you mentioned there that you go to your synagogue as well, um, your place of worship. Well, yeah. I'll get on to that in a minute. Um, but first of all, I will ask um, Kieran Deep the same question. So about praying. So how do you pray and why? And what is it like? Um, well, praying for in the Sikh religion is all to do with mindset. So it's a bit, it's very um, similar to meditation. Um, so it's about meditating on God's name, and there's lots of really beautiful religious songs that you can um, that you can do. Um, you find them, you can find them on YouTube anywhere really, um, because it's all about this idea of being able to connect with God through your mind, wherever you are. Um, so in Sikhism, um, we don't have any priests, um, but we follow the teachings in our holy book, which is called the Guru Granth Sahib. And any Sikh um, is free to read the, read the Guru Granth Sahib either in the Gurdwara, which is our Sikh place of worship, or you can read it in your home as well. Um, but most people tend to, to um, tend to come to the Gurdwara, so on a Sunday um more before COVID um, and go there every Sunday and it's nice and peaceful and calm just to sit there and reflect um, on your thoughts and um, so I think that's it. that's what it's like to pray um, in, in the Sikh religion for me anyway. Nice that's lovely so you're also talking about going to your place of worship and um, can either of you tell me about um, reasons why that you go to the your place of worship whether it's regularly or now and again What's that like? I'll start with you, Sydney. Okay, <laughs> so um, in Scotland, we have a number of synagogues. I believe there's six synagogues and they're community, bu community buildings. You generally go for prayer services. So the busiest is Saturday morning. Uh, we also have Friday night. I mean, there, there are services three times a day generally, although usually people don't always go. <laughs> so the, the required number you need for a, a prayer is 10. And usually there's 10 people <laughs> at those at those weekday services. But Saturday morning, uh, before COVID, we could get, yeah, a good yeah, 100, 150 on a good day. Um, it's really nice to see everybody. And then there's nice snacks after. But <laughs> what, what's also really exciting about um, this idea of Jewish community spaces is it doesn't have to be in the synagogue. So I like to do a lot of things outdoors. So to go on hikes with um, with people, um, in like in a Jewish context like let's go on on a, a weekend trip away and let's have activities and prayer services and all these things and I, I really like the idea of not keeping it based in one specific place but that we're, we're Jewish everywhere right if God is everywhere I'm Jewish everywhere not just in the synagogue and like what what else can we do to get us out of a physical building that's nice I like that idea of doing hiking <laughs> <laughs> Hiking is a Jewish person, hiking people of different faiths. Uh, lovely. What about you, Kendi? Um, quite similar to what Sydney just said is that we, we don't think that God um, is specifically just in the Gurdwana. We believe he's everywhere. Um, so the Gurdwana, or um, it literally translates as House of God, the Sikh place of worship, um, is quite a, it's quite a unique place and that is open um, I'm sure all religious places like this, but it's kind of open to everyone and lots of people are encouraged to come in. There's also a um, free community kitchen at the Gurdwara, which serves um, all vegetarian meals um, to anyone who comes in and that's run by um, volunteers. So that goes along with the principle of um, selfless serving service or helping others. Um, so before COVID, I used to go there about once a week and it was a real kind of community hub where you'd be able to meet people, um, other people in the Sikh community in Scotland, so maybe friends um, or family members that you hadn't seen um, and you can like kind of catch up with them as well. So it was a real community space and it's just, I think it's just a place for people to come and reflect, but also to have that kind of community band um, as well. Thank you. Yes. Can I can I share with you a story yeah. about um what so when I was living in India I traveled around a lot and I went to the the Golden Temple which is if if I am correct the the holiest yeah. um 
building for for Sikh people and it was such a beautiful so it's a huge huge complex and they have a room a special room for foreigners <laughs> um where you can stay and like you can stay like you sleep there for free and you eat food and like I was my Hindi was just good enough then that I could like sit on the floor and speak with all of these old ladies we would like chop vegetables together because they cook for like hundreds of thousands of people every day and I just spent I think two whole days chopping vegetables and speaking with them and eating with them in this community dining hall. And like, it was just such a special, special thing. And then we go outside to the main complex and everyone is walking together. And like, it's not, you know, like I was just, just a random tourist who was there and, but there were people who were pilgrims and there were people of all religions just walking around. It literally was the highlight of my time in India. It was so special. And as the sun set, everybody faced inwards and chanted prayers together. And it, it was just like the most beautiful thing that I've ever experienced. I had such a great time. Yeah, it's really the um, Golden Temple or the Hermundar Seb is, um, I think the way it was built as well was to be inclusive of all societies. So there's like four entrances um, on, either, on either side of the building to kind of symbolize that like, everybody is welcome and yeah it's a, it's a really special place I think um definitely but you probably did more than me Sydney I don't think I'd be able to speak in fluent Hindi to to anyone <laughs> it was so, better than me than that well, it wasn't <laughs> fluent Hindi it was like how many oh. do you have <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a wonderful place to visit thanks for telling us that story Sydney um, so I've got, before I leave places of worship, I've got two very specific questions for you. So one comes from uh, pupils from primary six at St. Dennis Primary School in Glasgow, and that's for Kieran Deep. And, it's, and the question is, what do you wear to your place of worship, to the Gudwara? Um, well, traditionally, um, we normally wear, or I wear, a traditional Punjabi suit. So it's like quite um, baggy trousers and there's like a long kind of top and you have a scarf as well. Um, the reason that you have a scarf is that because when you're in the Gurdwara, two golden rules are you have to cover your head and um, you have to take off your shoes as well. Um, so I, I was trying to um, find a picture of me with one on, but um, I couldn't really find any suitable ones where um, I think it would be good to, to broadcast on, on the TV. But um, they are very, very colourful and they're really nice. They're very comfortable, but it doesn't mean that you have to wear um, this when you go into the Gordobara. You can wear anything you want. You just need to be comfortable. It just has to be respectful. Um, so as long as you're, um, you've got that, then that's absolutely fine. Oh, and is there a special reason for covering your head? Yeah, so um, you're asked to cover your head as a sign of respect to God um, because the top of the head is regarded as being quite a spiritual place for Sikhs because that is kind of seen as the main way of connecting with God is through your mind and through your head. So that's one of the main reasons that we, that we have our head covered. So men and women um, it would be asked to cover their heads when they go in. That's really interesting, thank you. And that's uh, kind of similar in a way to my next question because we have a question from pupils at Bowness Academy in Falkirk. And this is for Sydney. And the question is, why do Jewish people wear a kippah? And that's another head covering in the Jewish faith. Yeah, I think it's a really similar um, reason that, that we remember that something is above us, that, that we are mindful of God. There's also a few other garments traditionally that Jewish men would wear. And one of them is a sort of square undershirt that goes under the clothes and it has fringes that come down the side um, on all four corners. And a lot of people wear them actually tucked into their trousers so that you can't actually see them. And, and that I think is really special because it's sort of you can feel it, you know it's there, it's a reminder for you that you need to practice your Judaism and you need to be mindful of who you are, but it's not, it's not showy, it's not flashy, like it's, it's really a personal thing. Um, but, but men also would cover their hair and also married women would cover their hair. Um, that's more as a sign of modesty, but the men really is as a reminder that there is something more high than you out there. Mm, good, thank you. Now, I've got a question that everyone loves to ask because it's about food and everyone loves to eat, don't they? So I have a question here. Again, it's from St. Dennis Primary School, Primary 6, and they'd like to know, do you eat any special foods? So 
How about you, Karen Deep, first of all? Um, well, food is a massive thing in, um, in the Punjabi culture or to do with Sikhism. Um, so in uh, the Gurdwara in Lixib Four, there is a community kitchen, which is a free kitchen, and that serves all vegetarian food. So like vegetable curries and um, the chapatis or rotis. Um, and you'll get like a little, it's, it's really a three course meal that happens. So yeah, it's quite a feast that you get. Um, it's all vegetarian. There's no meat um, allowed in the Gurdwara and you're not allowed to um, smoke or consume alcohol in the Gurdwara or even outside it. Um, in the kind of vicinity, so like the car park or something, you can't have meat, alcohol um, or be smoking there. So these are our main kind of Punjabi, um, Punjabi foods that's in it. We also have little... Um, sweets, which are, if you're on a diet, I would not recommend that you that you eat them. Um, they're normally quite, there's a lot of sugar and a lot of butter involved in the traditional um, Punjabi sweets called Mithai, um, so you might have that as well. Great, thank you, lovely. Um, how about you, Sydney? Any special foods? Yeah, Jewish foods might be a bit less exciting than Sikhs, <laughs> very delicious. Um, but there's also different Jewish cuisines, so for me, really traditional food is like matzo ball soup um it's like these balls of dough that go in a soup sometimes people think they're a bit strange um challah is really traditional challah is like a braided bread that you eat friday night there's there's different foods for all of the different festivals so passover or pesach which is usually april time we eat special flat breads called matzah they don't taste very good um in in december for hanukkah we eat latkes which are these fried um like potato pancakes, those are a lot better. So really each holiday has really special food, but then we also have other the other types of cuisines, right? So the Jews in India have their whole different Indian Jewish cuisine and Jews in Scotland love a good burn supper. So we have the, the haggis, um, which is kosher, kosher haggis we get from Mark's Deli in Glasgow. And, um, you know, each, each sort of different Jewish tradition from different countries has their own regional Jewish food, which is really exciting to explore. Lovely. So, so something for everyone. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> Super. Okay. Um, so we have a, actually got a question again for you, Sydney, and this is from pupils at Bowness Academy in Falkirk. And they have been learning all about Shabbat and they have questions about Shabbat. So I'm going to ask you, well, first of all, could you tell me just a little bit what Shabbat is before I ask you the questions that they have about Shabbat? Right, so we have the story in the Old Testament, or the Torah, that God created the world in six days, right? We have the, the first day, which is the darkness, and the light, and the water, and the animals, and the plants, and all of these things. And on the sixth day, he created humans, and on the seventh day, he rested. And so we, every seventh day, which is Friday at sunset until Saturday at nightfall, also rest. What does it mean to rest? That's complicated, depending on who you ask. <laughs> Um, for me, what it means is I'm plugging from technology, so I don't use my phone, I don't use my computer, I even wouldn't drive, I wouldn't turn on the lights, I leave the lights on so that I can see, <laughs> but I wouldn't turn them on and off during the day. Um, and it, spending time in the synagogue, spending time with my friends, having a festive meal, doing all sorts of things like that. Um, and it's a really special time and it comes every seven days, which means that in a year, you're celebrating a lot of Shabbats and you're spending a lot of time really taking a break and pausing. Great, thank you. That's something people must find quite difficult these days, not being able to have a look at their phone, but it's very good to be able to have a break and have a rest. Um, so some of these questions from school people, they're really asking you what things you're allowed to do on Shabbat. So they're asking things such as, are you allowed to go for a walk? Can you make a snow angel? Can you play a musical instrument or sing Jewish songs? Someone would like to know what happens if your birthday is on Shabbat and do you ever get bored <laughs> during the day? The thing about Shabbat is that everyone does it in their own way. So growing up, we would have a dinner with my grandparents Friday night and then we would drive home and then Saturday, sometimes we would do things, sometimes not. Sometimes we would go to synagogue. Um, and then when I was 18, when I became an adult, I really started to do things differently my own way. And I learned more about the traditions and the laws. And one of the things about Judaism and uh, many religions, I'm sure, is that there's different aspects that, that are interesting to different people. So 
when I first started learning about it, I wanted to know all of the technical things. Like, can I do this? Can I do that? Um, can I, some people have this tradition where they won't rip on perforated lines, you know, like, so, um, so toilet paper has perforated lines. And so a lot of people will rip their toilet paper before Shabbat and leave it in a stack. And then on Shabbat, they'll only use the pre-ripped toilet paper. And I wanted to know all of the technical things like, can you open a food package? And if you want to know the technical things, there are so many resources about how to open packages. Like if you, if there's writing, then you should rip around the writing. Or if it's a can, then you should stab a hole in the side before you open it. Some people don't like that. <laughs> I personally, now, if you know, sometimes you get stressed out and I just want to focus on the the restful atmosphere. Can you walk? Yeah, I love to go for walks on Shabbat. Sometimes I, I, since I have the time, since I'm not worried about working and going on my phone and watching TV, I'll go for a six hour walk and I'll walk, you know, as far as I can because I have the time to appreciate that. Can you make a snow angel? I'm not sure you would have to ask a rabbi on that one. <laughs> um, Shabbat's a really, really special time and there's all sorts of things. Can you celebrate your birthday on Shabbat? Of course, because Shabbat is a time when you can celebrate with your friends and eat delicious food and really appreciate the things around you. Um, so there are lots of technicalities and there are lots of lots of really special times to spend time doing things that are important to you, like reading and walking and seeing your friends and enjoying birthday cake. And singing? And singing, yeah. yeah. Lots and lots of singing, yes. <laughs> Very good. And there's one other question about that, about Shabbat um, during Hanukkah, so during a Jewish festival. Is it is it different or is it the same? Yeah, it's slightly different. Um, it's a lot the same and it's a lot of extra excitement because you're not only celebrating Shabbat, you're also celebrating another festival. So there are certain things like on Hanukkah, you want to make sure that first you light your Hanukkah candles, right? We light eight candles every day of Hanukkah, one candle the first night, two candles the second night, three candles the third night, and so on. You want to make sure you light your Hanukkah candles first. And then you light your Shabbat candles so that you're not um, making a flame once it's already Shabbat. So there are small technicalities that change how it goes. There is one holiday that we don't celebrate on Shabbat, and that's the saddest day in the Jewish year. It's called Tisha B'Av, um, and it usually falls out in August. And it's a 25-hour fast day, so we don't eat for, or drink anything, water, nothing, for 25 hours. And we commemorate the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which happened almost 2,000 years ago. <laughs> and if that falls out on Shabbat, then we do it on Sunday because it's Shabbat is really a time to be happy and Tisha B'Av is really a time to be sad and we don't want to mix those. But generally, when a holiday and Shabbat fall on the same time, it's, it's a lot of excitement and a lot of fun. We actually just had this past Friday, it was a Sukkot, which is a festival and Shabbat and they were at the same time and it was very fun. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thank you. That's lovely. Okay, so I've got a few more questions, and these questions are about how your religion and your faith affects you in your daily life, so the ways that you live your life. So could you tell me what your religion tells you about being a good person and how it affects you in your daily life? So over to you, Karen Deep. Um, I think the biggest thing that Ziki teaches you about right and wrong is that you should try and live your life as a honest person um, and that comes down to working hard um, and also you should try and live your life to help others. If you're in a position where you're able to donate to charity or even help someone, so even helping your neighbour, especially during these Covid times when there was a lockdown and you know, that you could go and ask your neighbour, are you okay? Do you need me to bring you anything? So little things like that. There's always, there's always little ways that you can help someone um, throughout, your, throughout your day. Um, how it's affected me in the way that I live my life is that I've got a very strong passion for human rights. Um, and I think that's kind of come about because of the value of Sikhi, of fighting um, for justice or so helping others 
um, that might not have been able to fight up, fight for themselves in different situations, um, particularly with human rights in, in my case. So I think that's been a huge factor in terms of um, the way I've chosen my career, I've chosen what I want to do with my life, is kind of based on, on um, Sikh values. When you say fighting, you're not talking about... Oh God, no. Not, fighting, are you? <laughs> No, no, I'm not talking about having a fight, definitely not. Um, this is more about um, just if you see something that is that you think is wrong or um, if you think, oh, but well, that's not very fair for that person. Um, why, you know, why has that happened to them? Then you should kind of stand up and um, talk on that other person's um, behalf if they're not able to talk for themselves and also help them. Um, if, if they need your help. So I mean that kind of thing, Not definitely not fighting um, physically. That's a big no-no um, within the Sikh religion. Cool, thanks, thanks, uh, Um So yeah, Sydney, how about you? Judaism has a lot of things to say about being a good person and gives us a lot of really relevant examples of how we can encounter situations. And what's interesting is that the Torah was written several thousand years ago, but a lot of the examples are still relevant today. So we have rules about how to treat other people. We have also, interestingly, a lot of ideas about how to seek forgiveness for things. And um, one of my favorite stories also comes from the Talmud, which is this massive Jewish book, um, which has all sorts of examples and discussions about what we're meant to do. And one of the stories is about a man named Honi, Honi Hamagel, which means Honi the circle drawer. That's what he did. He drew circles. <laughs> and he planted this carob tree and this guy was walking and said, what, why are you planting a carob tree? It's not going to grow fruit for several, several years. Um, 70 years, I think is the number they give. And he says, yeah, but it's not for me that I'm planting. I'm not planting this tree so that I will eat the carob. I'm planting this tree so that my children and my grandchildren and their children will eat this care of and really thinking for the future and building foundations for the future. And that's one thing that I really love about Judaism. You asked how it affects me. I mean, so obviously I've chosen to, to be a full-time Jewish educator and to move around to different countries doing that work. So it, it has a huge impact on my daily life. But one specific thing that I think really I gain a lot from is this idea of really being grateful for every moment. I mentioned before, we have these blessings that, that every piece of food you put in your mouth every second, when you see a rainbow, there's a blessing. When you see something really beautiful, when you smell something nice, there's blessings for all these different moments and there's rituals for so many aspects of, of, of daily living. And I think for me, one of the things that is has been most beneficial for me about being really intentional about the way that I practice my Judaism is having this sort of toolbox to reflect and to constantly help me be grateful for the things around me. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so we've got the last question now, and this is a, quite an interesting one. So it is, what is it like living your faith in Scotland today? So what's it like to be Jewish or Sikh in Scotland today? What, what's good, what might be difficult, over to you. All right, we'll start with you, Karen D. Um, so the good things are the Sikhi is um, it's a very inclusive religion. It's all about practicing the values of equality. So it's very much based on men and women um, being the same. Um, however, as with all religions, um, sometimes culture does come into it. So that's why sometimes you might go into the Gurdwara and you see that men and women are sitting on opposite sides. That's not how it should really be, but I think that's just the way culture is. Um, another positive, I think, is that, yeah, it's just something extra you can bring um, when you're in a discussion with other people or because um, you have the kind of different mindset um, to, to someone who might not be following this, the Sikh religion. But just talking with um, Sydney today, I realised there's actually quite a lot of similarities between um, even um, Judaism and um, within Sikhi as well. I think one of the challenges um, is perhaps that um, sometimes because of the way we look, um, Sikhism is quite an expressive religion. Um, so you may find that a lot of men, they wear um, like turbans um, and they might be wearing like um, a kirpan, which is like a small ceremonial dagger and that's given to baptize Sikhs. 
um, sometimes people who aren't on the Sikh religion think that those individuals, so for example, a man with the turban is actually um, following, he follows like Islam. So sometimes there's a bit of confusion with that. Um, and some people can then um, maybe attack us because they think we're of a different religion. So that's maybe a, a, a bad side to it. Um, but I think that that's why things like this are great, where you can just come and um, ask, ask as many questions as you want about the Sikh religion to try and learn a bit. But there's definitely a lot of positives um, to be in a, to be in a Scottish Sikh. Okay. And I think also because we um, we share the the Scottish love of um, sweet things. So iron brew and tablet, we also have quite a quite a love for um, sweet sweets. <laughs> deep fried maybe. Okay. Yeah definitely deep fried. There we go. We've got deep fried corn as well. That's, that's it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Karen Deep. And how about you, Cindy? Yeah, Scotland's a really lovely Jewish community. It's very small. Um, there, are, there aren't official numbers because it's so hard to, to really count down, but the estimate is really that there's between 3,000 and 5,000 Jews, I believe, in Scotland, which is very small. Where I grew up uh, in Calgary, we had around 8,000 Jews, and that's, for Canada, considered very small. One thing is that we're very close to London, which means that um, London has a huge Jewish community, and people here can benefit from some of the, the programs going on in London, whether it's online, whether there's retreats or things that, that happen. Um, having a small community is a challenge, but it's also a really lovely thing because it means that everybody knows each other. It means that it's very easy to get involved. It's very homely. It's very lovely and, um, and warm and loving. And it's it's very, very special to be, to be part of such a small community, even if it does have its challenges. Um, Jewish communities sometimes have faced anti-Semitism, um, which is, um, I don't know what the definition is, <laughs> meaning like acting negatively, not liking, um, perhaps even being violent or worse to Jewish people. And in, in some places, it's been very, very, very bad. In Scotland today, um, there are small instances, but it's not it's, it's not dangerous generally to walk down the street as an obvious Jew, which is very, very lucky because in some places it is. And Scotland's generally a very, very nice, warm, loving place. And people are very friendly. People are very inquisitive. When I represent Jewish people at, at events or at schools, oftentimes I give assemblies, um, Jewish assemblies at public schools, and people are always very interested and very nice and very friendly. And I, I think that Scotland's generally a pretty good place to be a Jewish person today. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's been really a delight to speak to you both. I've learned loads and I hope all, uh, all the people watching the programme have learned something new as well about the Jewish and the Sikh faith and just to get to know you as well as individuals. So thank you again and uh, do tune in as well for the next Ask Me Anything shows as well with people from all different faiths and backgrounds. So thank you and bye for now. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks, Karen Deep, as well. It's lovely to meet you. Oh, lovely to meet you, Sydney, too. It's been really, really interesting. Very eye-opening. Mm -hmm. <laughs>